Real quick before I start this video, I just want to dedicate it to my friends Dan and Jordan up in the north of the United States. Stay awesome. Welcome more gamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Stuff, and I have a very special video for you here today. See, my buddy Dan reached out to me and asked if I had a video where he just, um, I'll go through and just point by point break down the factions that exist in Age of Sigmar at the current moment. I said, no, I don't, I don't have one video that does that, um, but I can make one for you if you'd like. And so that's exactly what we're going to do here today. On the shared screen here, I have uh, basically just the Games Workshop page for all the factions pulled up and we're going to go through one by one, throw some ideas out regarding their lore as well as kind of what you can expect when you play them as an army. These are broad strokes, there are a lot of nuance to each of these. If you see a model you like, lean into it kind of a thing. But again, we're painting broad strokes with what each faction is in this wonderful game. So let's go get to it. We're going to kick this party off with the Cities of Sigmar. These represent the mortal forces of, you know, order, overall, capital O, order. And essentially their story is that these are refugees that lost everything when the Age of Chaos began. Chaos forces came in and uprooted these guys from their homes. And you'll notice there's a lot of different races, you know, fantasy term speaking, in terms of elves and dwarves and humans and all these kinds of things. Well, that's because chaos came in and destroyed entire kingdoms and those who were smart fled to Azir. And so you have all these people from commoners to nobles showing up in one place with the doors shut to the rest of the realms because Sigmar shut the doors of Azir. And so they had to work together to create a new society in Azir, of course. But then also the hundreds of years spent working together gave them a plan on how they're going to retake that which was lost. And so when you look at this, it looks like a mishmash of various units. And of course it is, but they work together in order to reclaim lands that were taken from them. Humans will help dwarves retake ancient holds that were destroyed, much like, you know, elves will help humans clear out, you know, farmland from heritage-based farming communities and that kind of thing. So a lot of model diversity here, a lot of units and different fantasy types helping each other and overlapping. Now, when it comes to how the army actually plays, that is a hard one to articulate simply because of the sheer amount of models here. Um, if I could say there's one strength of this army, it's that you can truly do whatever you want, right? There's so many different kinds of lists and archetypes and, and strengths to it that you can design whatever city you really want. Now, the con to that is it can be very hard to get started because, again, the amount of options available to you. So this is one where I recommend... Just have a look if there's really a certain set of models that appeals to you. Head on over to eBay, see if you can get them cheap, because a lot of these are from, you know, fantasy battle times. They're older models. They're probably on eBay for a little bit less money. It's, it can be cheap to get into. It could also be extremely expensive, depending on how deep into the well you go searching. So it's kind of all over the place. It's certainly the hardest army to articulate from a collecting standpoint. All I can say is if there's a play style that really appeals to you, or you just want to have the flexibility to do just about anything, Cities of Sigmar is a great choice. Now, next up are the Daughters of Cain, a very specific type of elf that exists in the mortal realms. Essentially, one named character named Morathi, which was a very prominent dark elf figure from the old world, uh, and is actually the giant snake with wings that you see scrolling up from the bottom of the screen. She arrives in the mortal realms, kind of mutated and changed into that form. And so she cast this illusion to look like a regal leader, which is the smaller model you see along with her. Now, together, they basically try to rebuild the elven race as she wanted it to be in the old world, which is a strong emphasis on females. It's very much a uh, matriarchy uh, mixed with a, a strong military discipline. And so she is taking all the elves she can find and she's creating witch elves and sisters of slaughter, basically a religion based around Cain, which is a god that existed in the old world for the elves but they don't understand she's lying to them. 
she is telling them Cain exists, he's super real, you know, he, I'm his prophetess, and she's lying to them the whole time because she wants that power. And all of the worship and prayers and energy they pour out for Cain is actually going to her. Now, for the longest time, she was trying to attain godhood, and then in the Broken Realm series, she actually did it. And so, it's a great army, they're often active in the narrative, um, really strong emphasis on things like slaughter and mayhem and combat. They are truly, when it comes to more talking about their play style, a glass cannon. They don't like taking a punch, but they can dish out an enormous amount of damage if you let them. One of the things when it comes to their play style is you're going to see, you know, sort of like half monster, half elf type things like you see the canary heart renders and the blood stalkers and all that. You're mixing some of the strengths that, those are like creations that Marathi made herself and their synergies are working with those bigger pieces like the Cauldron of Blood or the Blood Rack Shrine to create meaningful, you know, advances in the tabletop. Basically, it's a lot of synergies to strengthen each other up. They have some great prayers, some great spells, and they're going to use this to take their basic infantry, which is sort of these girls right here, the witch elves, and turn them from bikini clad nobodies to absolute Rambos, one woman death machines, and then there's a unit of 30 of them. Next up are the Fire Slayers. These are the uh, very like Slayer-centric dwarves that were new to Age of Sigmar. And essentially this is a patriarchal society based around families and clans, and they all send their sons and their warriors out to go fight. Their mission is to obtain what's called Urgold, which is sort of, it looks like normal gold to the rest of us, but it actually has the essence of their fallen god Grimnir in it. And so they're trying to channel and release his power to kind of put him back together. So they had this religious overtone to them, very family centric. Um, you know, you have the rune father is in charge and he has his sons as his heirs kind of a thing. And with that, you get a lot of martial pride. Gameplay wise, they are very stout, very tanky. At the time of recording, there's a new battle tome coming out for them. So I don't want to chat too much about their play style as that may change. But you're gonna have relatively few units. They're a somewhat elite army. They tend to be two wounds each uh, for the basic guys, and they can just kind of grind your opponent out. They have awesome uh, stat lines in terms of, you know, they can all throw axes in addition to hacking people up in melee. They've got some sweet models when it comes to the Magma Droth Riders, which are coming onto the screen now. And so there's a, like, a lot of cool models in the thing. But one thing you'll notice as this comes to the end of its scrolling is that there's not a lot of models here. The Fire Slayers are one of the smallest army ranges possible. And that makes them a bit of a, a thing to keep in mind when you talk about collecting them. Truthfully speaking, you can buy two start collecting boxes and a whole bunch of you know separate kits the, for the more elite infantry and have an entire army ready to field, ready to go pretty fast. And so they can be both limited in options, but also very easy to jump into. And they have this very aggressive play style. One of the coolest faction rules as of right now is essentially you can pick an army wide special rule per turn, and then you just can't pick the same one twice. You have like six or seven that you can choose from. I don't know if that'll carry forward, but I hope it does. And they got some really cool stuff to benefit them. Uh, what I will say is that if you are looking at these guys, that's totally cool. They're fantastic miniatures. They look great and they act really well on the tabletop. Just be aware that you do, if you're playing a standard 2000 point army, have 400 points of allies to bring in. And so you can shore up their weaknesses. Like for example, having long ranged guns or something like that. You can really, really help yourself out by taking allies more seriously than you would with some other armies just because of their limited options. Next up are the other army that's getting a faction update right now, and that is the Eidnith Deepkin. So these are underwater themed elves. You may, uh, you may have noticed I mentioned before with some of the mutant creatures that Marathi had in Daughters of Cain, she basically pulled souls and then kind of made them to her own image. Well, so did another elven god named Teclas. His first draft, I should say, uh, was called the Eidnith Deepkin. That's how we know them now. He basically made them, but he saw that there was something defective in their souls after he created them, and he wanted to destroy them. He's like, let's wipe the slate clean, we'll try a, a second experiment. Well, in that interim of him deciding to do that, his experiment escaped. And so the Deepkin are elves that don't have a god who wants them around, and instead 
fight for their own survival, and they basically rely on secrecy. In practice, this is like Dark Elves from 40k or Dark Eldar in Age of Sigmar. They are light, they have fantastic vehicles, they can operate with like multiple threats coming at you. Um, they have some wonderful lore in terms of the subservient class, known as Namardi. They are blind, they are born without eyes. And so they have some defective parts of their souls. They go out and they actually do soul raids, which is they just go and they fight somebody, scoop up all the souls as they're leaving the body, and then come back to their home base underwater and then put those souls into their young so they can survive. So there's like this vampire of souls element going on along with their aggressive play style. Now, as I said, their book is coming out here pretty soon, so I don't wanna to comment too much on their abilities on the table, but what you will find is a good mix of infantry and larger models that complement one another. They have some fantastic heroes and, and buffs and stuff like that. They often, up till this point, have had rules that reflect like the changing ocean tides, like sometimes the tides go up and sometimes the tides get pulled back and that actually changes the rules that they have as the battle goes on. You also have a cool list of prayers and, and those kinds of things. There's a lot going on with this faction model wise. It's some of the coolest miniatures that Games Workshop has released. And you've got everything from strong cavalry to masses of infantry, fire and arrows or running at them with swords. Um, and then you have just nice centerpiece models like the Leviathan or the Eidolons, which are the kind of the really, really big heroes that they have that are meant to magnify everything else you own. All in all, a really cool army and I'm excited to see where they go in the future. Next are the Caradron Overlords, one of the neatest factions visually and lore wise of the entire game. Now, remember when I said with Cities of Sigmar, Chaos came in and all these kingdoms of dwarves and humans and all that stuff, they all collapsed and the smart ones ran away, right? They went to Azir. These particular dwarves were just experimenting with very crude, kind of rudimentary aircraft. And so instead of running away, they ran up. They actually just bound all their ships together and floated off into the sky and have spent the hundreds of years between the age of myth and the age of Sigmar, where we are now, developing that technology. They are a completely skyborne version of dwarves with a heavy steampunk aesthetic. They value knowledge and technology. They are a merit-based society, so they don't care about your long lineage. They care about what you can do and what you can prove that you can do. So they are unique for that reason amongst the lore, but also they have ships. They are the only faction that is so vehicle-centric in this entire game. They use that to their advantage by having these ships fly up mid-battle, come back down, drop a barrage upon their enemies. They have individual flight suits for like the Sky Wardens, which you can see there. I call them Balloon Boys. And they just tend to be very aggressive, shooting focused with some light melee elements involved. But overall, they are a stunning looking army. Now I will say, again, like the Fire Slayers, their model range tends to be a bit limited. They have one, you know, basic infantry unit. They're called the Arcanauts, and they're, they're not terribly great. I'm just going to be super honest with you. But what the Arcanauts were really meant to do is hold the objectives while everything else does this delicate dance of movement and shooting across the board to keep your enemy pulled in different directions while you kind of go after their heroes. At the same time, your heroes are greatly benefiting the ships and the units that are on board. So it is a very um, reactive play style. You have to be very quick with what your rules are, where you can go, think ahead where you want your ships to be in two turns because they'll go up in the sky and come back down, all that kind of stuff. So they're hard to play, but from my understanding, they're incredibly rewarding because when a plan goes off, it goes off perfectly and they have some devastating guns to make that happen. Next up are the Lumineth Realm Lords, the newest elves to be debuted in the Mortal Realms. As you can see, their god Teclas is over there on the right. He initially made the Deepkin, they were a failed experiment, and then he got it right with these guys. So these are like the, the beloved child, whereas the Deepkin are the unloved stepchildren kind of a thing. Um, essentially, after everything fell apart with chaos coming in, Teclas decided, you know what, we need to refocus and we need to really meditate on 
what it means to be a part of these realms, right? Why did chaos enter in the first place? And, and kind of work on self-discipline and enlightenment rather than literal martial combat. So he took all of his elves and they started to commune with nature of like, how did we reach this point? And so the Illumineth realm lords are essentially elves that are all about melee. They're all about fighting and shooting and that kind of stuff. But there is this entire arc of the faction that really focuses on communing with nature. The part of that we've seen most kind of out front in the open is the fact that they have um, two kind of sub factions within them. One that focuses mostly on communing with mountains where you have like guys wielding huge stone hammers and bull headed helmets and that kind of stuff. Uh, where they focus on defensive. I want to be as strong as stone, immovable as a mountain. And then they also have this other sub faction that focuses on wind, which is basically a lot of movement and speed and, and being lithe and all that kind of stuff. Now, juxtaposed between those two are the baseline of the factions. This is the Venari, as they call them. They have standard high elf stuff, archers, spearmen, cavalry, but then sprinkled throughout that are these kind of elite units that really, really focus on one part of nature and turn it into a weapon against chaos. Now, that's kind of the lore. The gameplay aspect is these guys are straight fire <laughs> because they can shoot, they can move, they can stand their ground if they need to. They have an immense wealth of options available to them. They have incredible rules. If you want to lose some friends, go super hard into this army and play competitively. Again, that's not how it has to be. You certainly do not have to play that hard. They have a nice, uh, I'm going to say, gas pedal that you can let up on and not lose all your friends when you're playing. But understand the potential to just like delete your opponents exists in this army pretty well. Um, one thing I will tell you, though, is there are a lot of rules that you need to memorize. Every unit in this army has a wealth of special rules as does the, the the battle tome itself for the entire faction and then the sub factions. And then, you know, you're keeping track of resources that they all have. There's just a lot going on. So this is not for the faint of heart. That being said, they're very pretty models. So if you like them, go for it. Then we move on to the Seraphon. These are ancient reptilians that essentially helped create the realms as we know them today. However, the architects of that plan are long gone and what's left are the servants who are left in charge of maintaining it. So we have the Slon and Lord Croak as their hero who are these mystics of mages of incredible power and then they have their little denizens down below them. Now, you may remember Seraphon as the lizard men from Warhammer uh, fantasy battles where they were like basically crafted in spawning pools and then brought up in that way. That still exists if you're going with some of the versions of them. They do have spawning pools, but they've decided to take the army in a new direction where some of them are starborn, meaning they literally fly between the realms in their ships and then try to destroy chaos forces wherever they can. And then there's the ones that are kind of land-based, kind of realm-based, where they landed somewhere and then their bodies just became more substantial and in tune with nature. So that's how you have the classic lizard men in one hand, but the starborn representing these crazy celestial concepts in the other. The two are the same, but they've adapted to their environments very differently. Now, that being said, what you get rules-wise when you're talking about playing them is an army where you can do just about anything. Like... You can have an army that's just a handful of models because they can take beasts as battle line, or you can field hundreds of skinks if you want to, which is sort of like the little nobody chaff unit and anything in between. They're exceptional, they have fantastic rules, but I don't find them to be nearly as overwhelming to remember as some other factions. I think they're very new player friendly. Your important heroes look important, like your uh, Slon and Starseers. And you just have a great plethora of units to pull from. Everything from basic cavalry to, you know, gliders and flyers and ripper dactyls and all these crazy things. You have lizard rising dinosaurs that act as tanks. You have some that are like huge laser cannons. There's just a lot of monsters and things to support them there. So if you're looking for a good starter army that has good rules, it's well balanced, I would say internally, meaning, you know, there's no duds. Uh, with a huge model line and a lot of just nostalgia value to it, these guys are a great way to go. 
Next up are the Stormcast Eternals. These are the heroes that have been forged by Sigmar, the god of lightning and storms himself, uh, during the Age of Chaos. When he locked the doors to his ear and he was, you know, basically hiding all these refugees in his realm, he started creating a new type of soldier meant to uh, one day fight back the forces of chaos. He has his mortals, you know, in the forms of cities of Sigmar, but he needed a real weapon to win the war of attrition. And so these guys were born. They are human mortal souls taken, augmented with godlike power and fury, and then put back into the realms as warriors. When they die, their lightning strikes back to his ear and they are forged new bodies and sent back out all over again. It's a terrible, endless cycle of war and mayhem and death. And that's what we're here for. Uh, and play style wise, they tend to be the sort of like jack of all trades, masters of none type of thing. You can lean hard into any particular type of play style pretty effectively. Um, you just got to choose whatever you want. Like if you want to lean heavy into magic, there's a way to do that. If you want to lean heavy into shooting, there's a way to do that. Um, whatever you really like about them, you can lean into and, and basically create an entire army for. They don't, however, have, you know, fantastic mechanics when it comes to, like, they don't have any kind of summoning. Uh, they don't have a very fast units, typically. They tend to be somewhat slow. Uh, but they do have a lot of wounds each, which makes killing them a tougher proposition than some other armies, for sure. With all that being said, this is one of the armies that I play. I really like them. They're cheap. They're super easy to get into. Like, for a new player, you just go hop on eBay. All of the starter sets that stick around have Stormcast in them. And so you can create a reasonable army on the cheap very, very easily, while also giving yourself an easy painting project. Because again, if you look at them, they're mostly armor. So once you get your armor color down, um, you just, it just kind of paint out the other things, the fabrics, the details, the weapons, and you're good to go. So they are a exceptionally easy and inviting, you know, product line to get plugged into and they're always going to be relevant lore wise which is really nice for me ending out the forces of order are the sylvaneth now this is a faction that's a little bit hard to explain okay so they are the forest folk of the realm sort of representing the will of nature itself led by alariel the ever queen the goddess of life and their job is to go and nurture life in every corner of the realm. Well, of course, chaos came in and, and destroyed a bunch of the realms. And so their job is basically sort of working alongside the other forces of order. They're a little bit strange, a little bit alien to them, but they're trying to do the same thing, which is just get rid of chaos. Now to do that, gameplay wise, they use terrain in a way that no other faction does. Okay, they are wholly unique in this regard. Essentially, they can sprout forests, they can use existing terrain pieces as them, they can teleport from these forests, they can set up defensive perimeters. They are tech, sort of a, a defensive faction in that regard. And then they have a lot of synergies to be able to take these heavy hitters like tree lords and stuff like that and swing way above their weight class with them. Now, there is a very nuanced play style here. You have to be un like very in tune with how terrain works, how model placement works, how these guys' synergies work, the spell lores, all of that. So there's a lot of knowledge. They, they tend to struggle on the competitive side, which is not something I super value or care about, but just be aware there's a lot to learn. Also be aware that if you're going to start collecting them, you will be painting quite a bit of terrain. There's actually a set, and I'm gonna scroll up here to it, called the Awaken Wildwood for 50 bucks. Uh, basically, it's these three parts, and you can combine them to make bigger rings if you want to. Do whatever you want. Essentially, this is going to be the main crux. You're going to be putting one of these down for free when you play the army. You have various ways of summoning more of these. So just be aware that if you don't like this, the tree, uh, as a model kit, uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't push you too far into the army. But I will say they are extremely unique. Whenever they do well, it seems like a victory that has been well earned. And they just have some of the coolest models in all of Warhammer. The first Chaos army we can talk about is one that is near and dear to my heart. The Beasts of Chaos. Now, where most Chaos armies will focus on a specific god or deity that they follow, these guys are all over the place. These are Chaos just absolutely 
in the truest sense of the word. They have no gods, no masters, no kings. These are the things that are in the woods that you are scared of. They form just very crude tribes called war herds. Uh, and they basically are a collection of several different subspecies all kind of roughly compiled together. You have the bray herds, which is sort of your, you know, centaurs, uh, goat men, that kind of thing. Your typical, like, beast of chaos. Then you have things like the dragon ogres, which are a subsect that is really just all about living in the mountains. And, and they're very uh, fluent in magics related to lightning and things like that. And then you also have your war herd, which is sort of your big, big minotaurs, doom bulls, things like that. Now, one thing you'll notice as we're scrolling here is the inclusion of god-specific units. If some of these armies dedicate themselves to one chaos god, first of all, uh, the rest of the beasts of chaos consider them cowards because they have to kneel to a god. But you also gain access to some perks, you know, being a zangor versus a normal gore is pretty good um they get stronger they get a little blessing but it is chaos undivided in general and then of course they can dedicate themselves to chaos god factions if they want to what you get when you combine all that is a faction that tends to rely on a lot of like huge hordes of units so lots of chaff lots of gore and ungore that are just there to die but in them dying they then allow heavier hitters like the minotaurs or the bestigors or the chariots or something like that to then move up and now hit a pin down target so that's the idea everything moves pretty quick there's a lot of synergies based on which of those three sub factions they are whether bray herd dragon ogres or the war herd a lot going on there they tend to be very aggressive your guys are going to die in droves but as long as they can deliver the heavy hitters where they need to be and allow them to do what they need to do, Beasts of Chaos have some real game. You have to focus on the objectives because you're going to be swarming those objectives and then clearing them off with heavy hitters. So go ahead and keep that in mind. This is a huge hobby project. You're probably going to buy a ton of models, but they are very cool. And when they're all working in tandem, it's a great deal of fun. The Blades of Corn are an army that focuses on murder, bloodshed, and war for the sake of it. They are led by Corn, the god of all those things, and uh, also the god of black metal music. So, we're talking about these guys. You're looking at a very melee focused army. Almost no shooting in this entire thing. Uh, they also do not use magic. Like, there is very little shooting, there is no magic. Um, they instead focus on prayers. You can see their terrain piece is a giant altar which erupts from the ground. You're going to see a lot of emphasis on things like blood, murder, all that kind of jazz, because that's what they do. Now, gameplay-wise, um, you're going to be looking at these guys and with a very fresh set of eyes. You see, any time a unit, friend or foe, dies, you get what's called a blood tithe point. You can use these points for a myriad of things, but one of the most important is summoning new units. So you can use these points to shut down spells or move guys or empower them, or you can just bring demons onto the board, which is a really cool thing. Beyond that, when it comes to the actual models, you're gonna see a lot of flesh tones. A lot of these guys are just standard warriors on ground with a weapon in their hand and a lot of armor with a whole heckin' ton of kind of like, uh, what's it called, trim going around the side, that kind of ornate trim that goes around the edges of the armor. It's a fun painting project. It can be a lot of work, but this is also a fantastic army if you're not sure what you want out of Age of Sigmar. For example, if you're like, well, I, I kind of just want to keep things simple by running forward and punching my enemy in the face, this is pretty much that just turned into an entire army, right? It's these guys and orcs are kind of the same thing in that regard. Uh, these guys have a bit more mechanics when it comes to prayer and exactly what kinds of units are rushing at the enemy. It could be hordes of uh, blood reavers or it could be a few more elite units of called blood warriors, sort of like the elite version of their infantry. They have a lot of options when it comes to demons as well, some wonderful kits. Um, and just some really cool options for you from there. So if you want to keep it somewhat simple, this is a great option if you want a chaos army. One thing to kind of be aware of, though, is that it, it depends heavily on lots of aura buffs. Like, so, for example, you have troops that have terrible stat lines, but if they're within, say, eight or nine inches of a hero, 
well, all of a sudden they get way better, right? They, that aura of the hero gives them some kind of bonus to their attacks or whatever. And so winning and excelling with this army is a, is a, a lot of making sure your units are within those bubbles, overlapping of heroes. So, you know, model placement is very important. Uh, that's just something you're just going to have to live with. Uh, it's just the way the army functions. But if you can learn that, they do exactly what you want them to do. They run forward and they punch things really hard in the face. And, you know, what more can you ask for? The Disciples of Zinch are next, and where Korn is an emphasis on, you know, rushing forward and punching on the face, Zinch is a matter of working with a lot of spells. They're a very magic, heavy and magic-focused faction, as well as bodies. So... Well, the most infamous unit in this entire faction is that of the Horrors. Okay, they're called Pink Horrors. When you kill one, it splits into two Blue Horrors. When you kill a Blue Horror, it splits into two Brimstone Horrors, which are on one base. But essentially, they can be masters of hordes by throwing Pink Horrors at you and just letting you chew through them to infinity while the Zinch player is laughing, cackling, and getting off a whole bunch of spells that are meant to destroy your enemy. They have incredible spell casters. The Lord of Change is an, an, I can't even articulate how good of a spell caster he is because of his special rules. And that's only augmented by the rest of the army. And so what you're going to see with this faction is a lot of throw horrors up front to pin the enemy down and bog them down on objectives. And then just run around rampant with a whole bunch of spellcasters just shooting lightning from their fingertips and eviscerating your enemy. Gameplay-wise, they uh, kind of do that exact same thing. One of the most unique mechanics in the Age of Sigmar is destiny dice. Essentially, before the game starts, you roll nine dice. And at certain intervals, it's very specific about how you can do this, but... Instead of rolling a die and leaving it to chance, you can sub in one of your destiny dice instead. Essentially, you get to cheat by taking dice rolling out of a dice game. And so it's often a joke that's made. It's a very cool faction that has you making a lot of really smart decisions and tactical plays. And it's also because you can curve uh, the probability of things working or not working. Very new person friendly. They have some terrific models, some newer ones. Uh, and then just a flood of demons and mortals and all kinds of cool stuff. One thing I will say, they don't make a lot of use of their mortal units in terms of Karak Acolytes are their basic dude. They're not terribly great. They're pretty fun, you know, but they're not stellar. Um, they also have Zangors, which are wonderful. Their demons are really where they shine. But there are plays that can be made with just about anything in the book. So they are fun. There's a deep toolbox here. And uh, their allure is just they're always conniving and, and scheming and, you know, how can you not love it? Then there are the Hedonites of Slanesh, an army that went from zero to hero to somewhere closer to zero again. Basically, it's a, a chaos faction that really emphasizes heroes. So a lot of named characters, lots of heroes on the table doing extraordinary things, delivering wounds to the enemy and taking them in, in tandem. So whenever a hero hurts an enemy unit or that hero is hurt, you'll gain something called depravity points, which can be used to summon demons. Now, that sounds awesome. The book is sort of in a weird place right now. It doesn't feel like it's playing in the same edition as everybody else. It's a little bit out there, um, kind of a scratch your head moment. But, you know, rules aside, they do have some of the coolest models. They've gotten a model line refresh with some wonderful, you know, mortal units, the Lord of Pain, the Bliss Barb Seekers. Uh, they even have Slongor, which is like the beastmen dedicated to Slanesh. Uh, and as well as just a whole bunch of cool units, they don't do kind of what you would intuitively think they do. Like, they're not quite as on the ball when it comes to murder and mayhem as the other chaos gods but they do play a delicate game of trying to keep your heroes killing stuff while also you want them to get hurt but not too badly hurt it's a very delicate line now that being said there are some incredible models here and lore you know slanesh has always been uh, in my opinion one of the most interesting deities in terms of age of sigmar lore because for the longest time he's been chained up um, by the elven gods and 
is slowly breaking free and Hen basically has a living avatar of himself amongst the realms in the forms of the twins, which we'll talk about later. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful model range. Gameplay-wise, they're not in the best place. They're kind of in this weird lurch between being hyper-competitive and nothing. And so um, if you like them, I say lean into it. Absolutely, they're fun for a hobby project. They got some sick, nasty-looking models. That being said, if you're looking for competitive stuff, probably mosey elsewhere. Rounding out the Chaos-specific factions, we have the Maggotkin of Nurgle, uh, the third Battle Tome and the first Chaos one to get you know an update for Age of Sigmar 3.0. Um, they've given us a glimpse of what future Chaos armies will hopefully look like, and it has us salivating because the Maggotkin of Nurgle are freaking awesome. Um, Nurgle is the god of disease and decay and entropy and all these things, and the longer that you are in combat with his army, you will feel that. They have this thing called disease points. Anytime an enemy unit's within three inches of them during the movement or combat phases, the enemy gains disease points, which can turn into mortal wounds at the end of the round. So they are literally so infectious that your opponent doesn't want to touch them. And so they are very elite. There's very few of them. They move very slow. But when they get to the enemy, they can just grind them out with all of these mortal wounds coming from various sources. Chiefly is the disease point mechanic. They have a great arsenal of demons. The, the plague bearers are fantastic if you take their support heroes. As well as a great complement of mortal units that can dish out devastating amounts of damage. Um, artifacts and spells are all wonderful. You know, I mean, they're they're nothing like they're not a magic focused army by any chance, but they have some cool tricks up their sleeve if your opponent's not paying attention. And uh, a great dearth of models. These guys have been refreshed both when Age of Sigmar first launched, so like during the end times of fantasy battles, they got some models. And then again, I think two years in AOS, they got the Pusquil Blight Lords, the the fly rider mortal guys there's just a bunch of stuff here wonderful models wonderful sculpts great to learn to paint with because you can do all kinds of different effects like rust and cloth and ooze and all these gross things and they play exactly like you'd expect them to on the table which to me is the most important part of any army Next up are the Skaven, and this is another one that's just like Cities of Sigmar where it's a very difficult to talk about because one faction contains such a dearth of models and model ranges that it can kind of be whatever you want it to be. These are the maniacal rat men that live underground and burrow and have their own little like dens and warns and that kind of stuff and they burst out from underneath cities and attack them where they're least expecting it bringing all kinds of weapons and everything like that from just hordes of guys with sharp sticks to huge warp lightning cannons which channel like chaos energy straight into someone's face they have a whole clan that's dedicated to pestilence and using diseases as a bioweapon rather than worshiping the idea of entropy like the guys of nurgle this is just straight weaponization of diseases. They have demons in the form of vermin lord deceivers, you know, huge blocks of infantry. They have Frankenstein monsters. If you want an aesthetic, it probably exists in Skaven and it looks super cool doing it. The only downside to the army that I want to throw out there and I can't not talk about is getting into them is very difficult. Um, there are a lot of stringent rules on army composition, how you can build these guys out because they're trying to kind of corral all the thousands of choices that you have to make. And so um, there's a lot of tips when it comes to army building that are important to remember, as well as the fact that they tend to die in droves. Um, it's a lot of dudes, a lot of base infantry. They just, it's kind of hard to get started with them is what I'm really trying to say because you're either going to make a bunch of purchases because there's not really a great starter box for them. There's not a cohesive vision for what an army looks like. So this one, you know, I do highly recommend it. If you like Skaven as an aesthetic or you like the idea of these little rat guys thinking that they're larger than life, you know, I totally get it. There's a lot of appealing things there. But just really take your time, learn the faction, watch some battle reports, and kind of plan your purchases. Otherwise, you can really fall into a deep well and, and kind of get burned out on it. So if you know what you're looking for and you get excited about it, man, this is one of the coolest armies out there. 
if you just kind of jump in with random kits, you can find that you spend a lot of money and don't have an army. So just kind of think about that a little bit and uh, plan it all out. Rounding out the Chaos factions are the Slaves to Darkness. Whereas most Chaos armies are dedicated to a singular deity, these guys are Chaos Undivided, but not in the same way as Beasts of Chaos. Beasts of Chaos are all about, you know, just brute strength, might makes right, no gods, nothing like that. The Slaves to Darkness are people who have chosen Chaos, but they kind of view it as a pantheon. You don't worship a singular deity, you worship them all in tandem. And so, you know, they're not subservient in the way, a Beast of Chaos would say that they're not subservient in the way that these guys are. What you get is a whole army that's under the martial law of Archaon the Everchosen, as he strives to become, like, the singular, I don't know, the next Chaos God, the next big thing that's going to unravel the world. And behind him is a huge war machine. So these are much more formal and organized than the Beasts of Chaos. They have knights and warrior regiments and all different kinds of armaments, disciplined schools of magic. They can take and hold land, whereas the Beasts of Chaos just kind of destroy stuff and move along. This is about controlling and dominating the realms in a way that is not devoted to a singular Chaos God. There's a lot of different aesthetics in this army. There's some really cool miniatures. Play style wise, they're kind of hard to articulate, not because they can do a lot, but because they don't do much. For that, I mean, you have access to some really cool melee units uh, in the form of knights, but they're all just kind of like basic attacks. There's no special rules or anything surrounding them. You have some magic, you have some light shooting, almost no shooting, but really it's just a lot of dudes, boots on the ground, walking forward, punching people in the face. Now, for special rules, basically they're heroes. When their heroes kill another enemy hero or a monster, they get a boon. Basically the chaos gods look down upon them and go, that guy's awesome and you have a hero go Super Saiyan for the rest of the game. This can happen multiple times, of course. It's just a matter of how often you want it to. So their rules are very hero-centric in terms of that's who gives the benefits to the units around them and that's who walks the path to glory to ascend to higher powers by slaying heroes. There's a lot going on thematically, but on the table, it tends to just be put your models down, run forward, and, and cap objectives as best you can. So there's some really cool things that they've added recently with the Warcry Warbands that you can add and they all act as very cool individual painting projects but on the whole it's going to be an army that runs forward and grinds the opponent moving into the death factions we have the night haunt which are a very visually interesting army they just look terrific they can look a bit fiddly but they're actually really pretty resilient when it comes to the actual plastic kits um, and really what this is is it's a lot of bodies that all uniformly all of them ignore rend which is a huge mechanic in this game to be able to ignore they're all ethereal so only some of the attacks are going to land in addition to that they also have their deathless minion save so death armies in general get a six up save when it's all said and done regardless and so you get quite a few kind of the tankiest army that you can kind of put together from ghosty boys and they use a lot of, you know, objective capping units as well as ones that are meant to instill fear and, and play with the bravery statistic of your opponent's faction. So if your opponent is not aware of this, you can literally just scare many of their units off the table. They have some pretty cool spells, some pretty cool hero models. The Black Coach in particular is a wonderful piece. And this is supposed to be, they are sort of like a... Um, a consolation prize. Nagash, the god of death, was trying to kill everybody and immediately raised their spirits and his spell kind of failed. And so instead of killing everybody, it just raised a bunch of dead spirits from across the realms. And so that's what these guys are. It's just dead from everywhere, galvanized into a singular army at the beck and call of Lady Olander, who was the hero character here. And so you have a whole lot of light, small heroes that are meant to corral and guide a whole bunch of undead ghosties. And uh, it, they can be a super grindy army. You know, I, I don't know anything about them in a competitive sense, but I know that they can play in just about every phase of the game and do so fairly interestingly well. Then there are the Flesh Eater Courts. Now, 
this army is a whole bunch of madmen that have gone cannibal. Like things have fallen apart for these humans and they've just absolutely broken and lost their minds. Then a vampire comes around, uh, you know, he just finds pockets of survivors across the realms and he basically projects into their brains a delusion. And they're all on the same delusion uh, that they are in fact not cannibalistic madmen, but rather noble knights and lords and squires and that kind of stuff. So the army that you play with is a whole bunch of really deranged, nasty, half vampire monsters on, you know, dead dragons and all these kinds of things. But in their heads, they are civil and noble and everybody else is crazy and deranged. And so it's this fun game that you get to play where there's two stories happening at any given time. What your boys are doing and then what they think that they're doing, which is just a blast to think about. As far as gameplay goes, it's a lot of infantry supported by heavy hitters, terror geists, zombie dragons. Crypt flayers are fantastic for dealing with you know, lighter units. One thing I will say about this army from a collecting standpoint, it is probably the easiest army to get into. And by that I mean the start collecting box comes with a few kits. Uh, it has the terror geist on zombie dragon, has some of the heavier infantry and the light infantry, that kind of stuff. Well, most of the hero options for this faction are actually just internal kit bashes from various units. So when you get a box of crypt flares, you can build them as crypt flares, crypt horrors, or you can have courtiers, which are sort of the low level heroes for those respective units. So by buying multiple start collecting boxes, you can actually build it in many, many different ways and therefore pretty much flesh out an entire faction. So it's, it's really interesting how they did that. So even though there's few kits for this army, you can just keep buying those same great value discount ones and create a wealth of different types of units. Now we're on to the Asiarch Bone Reapers. This is Nagash's personal army of constructs. Essentially they collect bone, that kind of Asus material, and craft it and solidify it into new shapes and then take souls, do the same thing. Tear out the parts of the soul that you like, jam them all together, stick it in a construct body, boom, you have a warrior. And so the whole army is dedicated around martial tactics, very uh, Greek kind of like hoplite theme that you'll see running through them, all constructed of bone. And then some of the units are literally just strange creations made with harvested materials from their enemies. So they'll smash an opponent, take a day to collect all the dead, pull the meat from the bones, bones go are shaped into new weapons and new warriors and they keep on going so they are the ultimate weapon of attrition is kind of the idea here they have some cool spell casters some really strong infantry like your infantry are going to line up like hoplites and they're just going to defend and grind out on objectives you have some heavy hitters uh, in the form of units like the mortis guard and other things like that all supported by smaller heroes now I will say they felt more unique in the second edition of the game where, you know, the leaders of their units could issue orders and that was a new thing back then. But now that's changed a bit. The Mortec Guard uh, are kind of function a lot like other units in the game. One thing that's interesting is that they do not use command abilities the same way that everyone else does. In fact, they sort of have their own list of command ability equivalents because none of them can use standard command ability. So it is a very deeply tactical army. There's some really cool models, but you're, you are functionally playing a different game from anybody else. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind, take your time, learn the units, and really just get into it because you enjoy painting them. They're a very cool army. Uh, I love the way they look and sort of their movements on the tabletop. It, I love the kind of Greek aesthetic that they're leaning towards. Again, some of the hero models are fantastic. Just kind of be aware that there is a learning curve when it comes to the Bone Reapers themselves. Lastly for death are the Soul Blight Grave Lords. And so this is sort of the, the vampire plus etc. of the death faction. So anything that doesn't have a home anywhere else pretty much ends up here. Here, you will choose a dynasty from your vampires, wherever they herald from. Uh, you have some huge, huge chaff units like zombies and skeleton warriors and grave guard and dire wolves that have been dead and resurrected, like chaff units to rush forward, pin your enemy down and just win a war of attrition. 
as units are dying, your heroes are coming up behind them, these vampire lords and necromancers, and basically allowing troops to come back to life and restore lost models into different units. So they can be very grindy, they have some terrific magic spells that they can cast and synergies that basically allow these nobody units to hit way above their weight class. And so they're an extremely interesting army. You know, they, they play exactly like you'd expect, you know, a vampire lord with a bunch of thralls beneath him. One thing I will say that if you are a new player getting into the game, there's a lot of rules to memorize. There's a lot of rules that happen at different times because the way that models come back to units can vary. Um, which units have synergies based on their keywords is, is something you have to really keep track of. And then there's just a lot of models to choose from. There's some night haunt models that work here. There's, uh, you can lean heavily into skeletons and have synergies based on that. You can lean heavily into zombies and have stuff based on that. Uh, or you could just forego chaff completely and have nothing but blood knights as, you know, you just have like a fancy knight traveling war band where it's, you know, 30 some odd dudes, but they're all each individually a living tank. Like there's a lot of ways that you can go with this and all of them are super rad. So it's a huge army, lots of options because it has one of the oldest model ranges. So you're going to have a lot of choices to make. But that being said... The core idea tends to be the same. You can either run elite with the blood warriors or you go larger units of kind of nobodies and, and try to flank the enemy and pin them down and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and in that regard, it becomes much more of a, you know, how many dudes can you field while also throwing a whole bunch of, you know, heroes behind them to keep supporting them. Now, they did have a, a line refresh here very recently um, where they have new skeleton models. They have... Uh, new monsters and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff going on here, and they, they are a fantastic army, but I will, again, just say, take your time learning the rules. So it's going to be overwhelming at first. That's totally normal and totally fine. Don't worry about forgetting things. Just kind of make mental notes whenever you do. Remember next turn, and you'll be good to go. Starting destruction, we have the Gloom Spite Gits. These are the menacing little goblins that live in the caves and subterranean networks all throughout the mortal realms. They worship a thing called the Bad Moon. It is a celestial object that uh, when it kind of, it, it's a comet essentially that doesn't follow a trajectory. When it comes over an area, it has this grinning face of a goblin upon it and it just kind of stops in the air. Whatever it stops over will erupt with all kinds of goblins and stuff like that who again revere this celestial body as a deity and when it appears like fungal growths will sprout from the ground people just go insane uh, and these guys are just these evil little conniving guys who just stab at you in the shins with knives and shivs and there's a whole bunch of ways that they can attack you. Some worship the bad moon as like a spider egg and so they are spider riders. Uh, some of them see it as just a straight deity and they'll just rush up as, you know, with their mounts called squigs. And others are trogoths, basically giant um, trolls that are pressed into service by these uh, goblins to act as their war machines. This is arranged with a lot, a lot of character, some really cool models. And uh, essentially, when it comes to their gameplay, it's a lot of hordes, so you're going to be dealing with a lot of just individual guys backed up by some heavy hitters in the form of trogoths, so trolls and that kind of stuff. They have some cool magics. Uh, they can actually wield a lot of endless spells very, very in efficiently because their wizards can be so cheap points-wise. You can get a lot of spells on the table just by virtue of how many sorcerers you can field. Uh, that being said, there's some great tactics when it comes to having a unit of stabas, so just ordinary guys, just with a, you know, sword and shield or whatever, who are gonna die in droves, but you can load them up with hidden tricks and, and all kinds of stuff. Like, you can put a unit of fanatics, which are basically um, self-destructive, chain ball wielding maniacs inside that unit, and when your opponent goes to charge them, they pop out and they go, blah, and they just rush forward like madmen. In addition to that, you have large centerpiece models like the trolls, but also some of the spider riders riding in a unit called the Arachnarok, which is just the coolest. It's just a giant spider that's meant to stab, kill, and murder everything around it. 
um, backed up with some of their heroes riding giant squigs and now um, what Kragnos, the new hero god level character for destruction, it becomes a huge machine that you can can, can just pick your opponent apart part by part. Now, one thing I will say is they're not the most competitive. It requires a lot of models to get on the table with these if you do go with goblins rather than trolls. But that being said, if you're playing these guys, it is for the entertainment value alone. They are crazy. Their rules are ballistic and random, and they're so stinking fun. I mean, they're just cute, and they're fun, and it looks like they're having a great time, and you should too. Next are the Ogre Ma tribes. These are, like you might expect, Ogres that are always on the move looking for food. Food is their deity. They worship the Great Maw. Um, basically, their whole economy and merit system is based around providing food. And so you're going to have an army that is relatively elite, meaning very few models, but they're each individually huge. These are huge, thick boys with big bases. And so you're going to run into a situation where you can be outnumbered. Now, they do have ways to combat this, but once you start losing ogres quickly, things are going to go downhill fast. That being said, some of those uh, Beast Claw Raider elements, the guys who are riding like, you know, kind of frosty looking animals, all the mounted aspects of this army, they hit like Mack trucks. Okay, like straight up, they can pile drive into an enemy. So you have this mix of tankiness with a lot of killing power in the form of certain units and they all work together really really well it's a great army there's some wonderful characterful models in the range and so there's a lot of ways to explore it it's just keep in mind you are going to be outnumbered that is a reality you need to get used to and as long as that doesn't like you know send you over the edge and kind of tip the scales of of your tactics and it doesn't you know dilute your process of coming up with ways to win these guys are super gross to play against in terms of they can crush stuff. Kragnos uh, has been a piece that's been added to their roster recently as he can work with all destruction armies and he's brutal in this faction. So they are very cool. I love them. Uh, they also, just like Flesh Eater Quartz, have a start collecting box that you can build in. You can buy three of those and have an entire army and just love it i mean just absolutely love it and everything else beyond that is just a cakewalk and adding to it so there's some cool stuff here i highly recommend you check them out they are i think a pretty new person friendly army in terms of the rules per dude are not very complicated there's not a lot of complicated synergies or anything like that it's just a lot of thick boys moving forward not wanting to die supported by some stuff that can deal out immense amounts of damage so if you just want a very simple version of Warhammer, boom, here you go. Then there is the big dog amongst the destruction armies, and that is the Auric War Clans. Now, this army is a sort of a misleading one. It's one book, but there are actually three different complete factions and a fourth all-in-one in this book. By that I mean it's composed of Cruel Boys, which are sort of sneaky orcs. You have Iron Jaws, which are not sneaky. They are very blunt, melee-focused orcs. And then there are Bone Splitters, which are sort of tribal, uh, think primitive orcs. Like they're, they're just savage, crazy orcs that don't wear any armor. Those three can combine into a fourth faction called a Big Wall, which is just take whatever orcs you own and go have a great time. So collectively, lore-wise, they're kind of all over the place. They just represent all the different kinds of orcs that exist in the realms. And they worship the god Gorka Morka, which is a giant two-headed orc that can split into Gork and Mork if he gets into an argument with himself or combine into one Gorka Morka and lead his armies that way. That's about the only thing that you can say generalization-wise about these orcs. When you talk about the army, you really are looking at the different subtypes of orcs. Cruel boys focus on ranged attacks and, and kind of destroying your opponent with mortal wounds. Uh, Iron Jaws are extremely straightforward. If you want a new person army, that is the pinnacle of a destruction new force because the rules are simple. You rush forward. They have great profiles. There's not a ton of synergies. It's just a matter of knowing where you need to apply the pressure to your opponent. And then the uh, Bone Splitters, probably being the weakest amongst those three, is really about fielding large hordes of 
easily to kill guys and they just a lot of chaff but they can throw out an immense number of attacks and they really do focus more on using magic to kind of magnify their units so they are a little bit more nuanced than the other two but all three of these can be great fun if you're looking for a very simple play style i would say the cruel boys are probably the most complicated among them simply because of like you know the amount of synergy that it takes to make their stuff effective but that's about it and so um on the whole if you want just about any kind of play style you can find it here it's it's really cool how they did that and kragnos works in any of those sub factions including the big wall so you, it's kind of hard to make a wrong choice and then lastly are the sons of behemoth behemoth is a a deity level monster that existed in the story and he's actually dead now but his children, quote unquote, are giants, literal giants of the realms. When you play this army, you're going to have between four and I think the max is like 12 models. Like if I pause here, this is it. You're looking at every model in the faction plus Kragnos down here below. So this is what you got. Um, it's formed from two kits. So there's the Mega Gargant kit, which can make three different kinds of Mega Gargants that all have kind of a similar role but they have some kind of nuance into how they play with the army and objectives and then you have the man crusher gargants which are sort of the smaller maw giants that we've used traditionally and and that's just to kind of have some options for filling out larger units basically you can take two gargants as a unit of two or you can have the mega gargants kind of lead the charge uh, on their own this is an army that is kind of sweeping the tables right now because of just how many wounds they have. It's very difficult for some enemies to produce the amount of damage that these guys can take. And so that's kind of their main factor right now. It's a tough one to get into because the price point is so steep when it comes to buying Mega Gargans and Man Crusher Gargans. But if it's something that you want... It's actually super nice to do because these guys can ally into just about any other destruction army pretty well. Um, and that's a, that's a great thing because it means you can slow grow them, right? Let's say you start with Oric War Clans and you just want to like tack on something. Well, that's a great way to do it. And then you can kind of play with different options and boom, over time, you've got a whole Sons of Behemoth army. They have some really cool abilities like they can kick an objective marker like just literally punt it like a football which is super fun and you can kind of change the board state in that way but realistically this is for someone who's already super into warhammer and um, each of these models has a mountain of rules associated with them so there's a lot to learn but once you learn them they play pretty straightforward Wow, that was a lot. I hope that that was enlightening to some of you uh, as just a brief rundown of what each faction is like. If you have any thoughts that are disagreeing with me or you want to add on like how to get into certain factions that I said were particularly difficult, leave them in the comments down below. I'll pin the most useful one to the top. Thank you all so much for watching and listening and I'll catch you in my next game. Wait, nope, that doesn't work. Catch you in my next video. Happy Wargaming.